there's more X299 coverage. And this is the Gaming 9 from Gigabyte, or Aorus. This is the Aorus X299 Gaming 9, Gigabyte in small print. Goodness gracious, the features on this motherboard. X299, if you've been living under a rock, is the ultra high end, as of, you know, Q3 2017, uh, desktop platform from Intel. This is the platform that's going to support up to 18 cores on the desktop, although with the launch at Computex, you can only get the 10 core, which is what I've got here in the, uh, the Intel Core i9 box. Um, probably also going to try this with the KB Lake 4 core because those are super cheap. It's fine for a testing CPU. Although if you're going to get the KB Lake CPU, you should probably do that on Z270 instead of socket 2066 on an ultra high-end motherboard because you really couldn't take advantage of the really awesome features of this motherboard, a lot of them, without actually using at least the 6 or the 8 core. Um, honestly, the 8 core, 28 PCI Express lanes, not too bad. It's a better deal than the 10 core at $1,000, and the other CPUs go all the way up to $1,800. There's been some concern over the voltage regulation situation on the X299 platform because the Intel CPUs this time around, they've really drank the power, and that's sort of unusual for Intel. We've seen overclockers pushing upwards of 400 watts through the ATX 12 volt connector on the motherboard, which is just ludicrous. It's crazy. These these things are not designed really. They're not they're not really designed for more TDP than like 205 watts. And on on paper, it ranges from like 120 watts or well, I guess 90 watts if you really want to go on the really low end. 120, 150, 180 watts, 185 watts, something like that. Of course, if you overclock and you get a fancy cooler, you know that changes the equation a little bit but not 400 watts. My goodness, that's, that's crazy. But in terms of board real estate, there's not really a lot of board real estate for delivering power. Now, I emailed Gigabyte and asked them about the design of their power delivery system. And they said that the power delivery system is rated for 50 amps per phase, and the components that they use are rated for 125 degrees C and on up. So, Yes, if you're overclocking like crazy, this area of the board, the voltage regulation area behind the CPU, will generate heat, and it will be important to cool it. So, because this is sort of a new platform, and because that's sort of an unknown, I think that X299 testing is going to have to be done in real cases, as opposed to the test bench. Now, we've got the really awesome Lee and Lee with the plexiglass cover, and we're going to do some of our testing in that, but for this... This, I've got something a little bit special in mind. But first, before we get to all that awesomeness, we need to talk about this motherboard and the features that it has. Now, the first thing that I've noticed about this motherboard box is that it's heavy. I mean, this, this, feels, this feels substantial. I mean, they're, they're not kidding when they call this the Gaming 9, because you pick up, you know, it's just, that's a cardboard box. There's not really anything special to it. Uh, this thing's got some heft. In the accessory box, the first thing that catches my attention is this. This is a substantial PCI Express to M.2 adapter, and it comes with this ridiculous aluminum heatsink. This is what you need if you have an M.2 that is overheating. This, this is substantial. This is the good stuff. Uh, I can test it and be sure, but I don't think we're going to have a heat soaking issue with this heatsink because this is about a pound of metal, and so this is going to soak up a ton of heat. But we'll run it through the testing and see and be sure, but I think it'll be pretty good. There's a nice fabric sleeve on these SATA cables. These are ultra premium SATA cables. There are six of them in the box. So that is a nice aesthetic. That's a nice touch. We've got some RGB connectors. These are RGB breakout connectors for the RGBW. Uh, this time around the motherboard supports a digital LED control, meaning you can control the LEDs individually. We'll cover that more in a little bit. Here's our 2x2 802.11 AC wireless antenna solution. This is nice. This is much better than rubber ducks, rubber duck antenna. We've got another breakout cable for RGB. Uh, red is 5 volts, yellow is 12 volts, so depending on if your LED strips are 5 or 12 volts, this breakout header will give you an option for either one. We've got our high-speed bridge if you're going to run SLI, some Velcro cable straps. This is an M.2 to U.2 adapter. So if you have a U.2 SSD and you want to run a U.2 SSD, you can totally use this uh, in an M.2 slot and then plug in your M.2 or your U.2 device to the M.2 adapter thingy uh, and be able to run your U.2 device. 
got the Gigabyte G connector to make it easier to hook up your front panel connections. And then we got some analog temperature probes. So you can actually take these temperature probes and hook them up to stuff that you want to monitor the temperature of and make sure that all of your temperature is staying in check. Then we've got our M.2 mounting gear, our mounting screws and offsets and things like that. And then we've got a retention plug thingy for our wireless cables. We've also got the Gigabyte Aorus uh, CPU badge, which might double as a guitar pick, but is actually meant to be a case badge. Our installation manual, which is fairly substantial, and our driver installation CD. And that's pretty much it for what we've got in the box. Now notice that one of the things that was not present in the box was an ATX IO plate. And that is because the back of the motherboard has it built in. You just install the motherboard and you don't have to worry about the IO shield. The IO shield is just built right into the motherboard, which maybe makes the motherboard installation a little easier. Let's start with a physical tour of the board. Starting at the top edge of the board, we have a four pin SysFan 2 header. We have, then we have our two eight pin CPU power connectors. Now each eight pin connector can deliver up to 400 watts theoretically. I mean, that's what you get before the wires start getting hot and things are sort of not in a good situation there. So with two of these, you know, you would say 800 watts. I think realistically it's like 500 watts, 600 watts, something like that. But keep in mind the Core i9 is a less than 200 watt is a part is what it's designed for. Um, I don't think you should be dumping that kind of power into your CPU. But because this area is a little overbuilt, you might actually get a little bit more stability out of the system. Now this is the gaming nine. Physically, there's not a lot of room here for putting a heat sink. So there's actually a heat pipe connecting the VRM heat sink to another heat sink that's under the back IO panel here. Now I can see another couple chokes that are actually underneath this other heat sink behind the IO shield, but that's definitely going to help dissipate the heat and carry the heat away. You know, a uh, hot VRM area is a thing with X299, but you also have to keep in mind that the components, like the generation of the components, the FETs, the regulators, the chokes, all that has also moved up substantially from the last two or three generations of computer hardware. This voltage regulation circuitry is engineered to withstand, you know, up to 120 degrees C, up from 100 degrees C that, it, you know, the previous generation components. So, uh, you know, this area is going to be hot, especially if you overclock your CPU. Is it, is it detrimental or is it, you know, a very bad thing? No, I don't think so. You know, heat is the enemy of electronics. You're going to want to keep that area cool. If you can install a case fan or just monitor your voltage regulation temperature, you know, 70, 80, 90, something like that is probably okay. Anyway, back to the board tour. We've got our RGBW 12 volt, five pin um, LED strip header. So what Gigabyte is doing this generation is providing compatibility for the old school LED strips, the new school LED strips, LED strips that are RGBW or RGB plus, you know, the ultraviolet or infrared or whatever sort of fancy LED strips that you want to run. But it also has support for digitally controllable LEDs, meaning that there's a controller in the strip and you can individually control different LEDs, but we'll talk more about that. Then we've got our two CPU uh, fan connectors. So the two fan connectors there for the CPU would be good for like a push-pull type configuration. And then rounding the edge in front of the uh, dim slots, you've got another four pin connector which would be suitable for a water pump or something like that. And then just below that, you've got a two pin connector for one of those passive thermistors, you know, temperature sensors, thermal sensors, that'll plug in just below that. Then we've got our 24 pin ATX CPU power connector, another four pin fan header, a USB 3.0 header, a USB 3.1 Gen 2, that's 10 gigabit per second header. Then we've got our eight six gigabit per second SATA ports. And then just below that, we've got our Thunderbolt connector. So if you want to run Thunderbolt, you can run Thunderbolt with an add-in card on this motherboard, and that's just fine. Now hidden underneath, this heatsink is our first 80 millimeter M.2. We've got another M.2 here just below the primary graphics slot, which is 110 millimeters. Now the one below the primary graphics slot, you know, especially if you're using a blower style cooler, I would recommend that you use this lower M.2 slot or use the enclosed M.2 adapter first. This motherboard, you can run four M.2 devices. That's kind of nuts. You got one above the graphics card, one just below the graphics card, and another one that's here below the uh, chipset. At the bottom edge of the motherboard, we've got our front panel audio connector. This is on an isolated part of the PCB, so that should help with noise. Next to our front panel audio connector is a two pin digital SPDIF input port and a power port for our uh, LEDs. So you can get an LED demo or something like that. We've got our Eco, our OC, a reset switch and our power switch that are physically on the PCB that you can use. Then we've got two front panel USB 2.0 ports. We've got two four pin system fan connectors uh, just above the two four pin fan headers on the bottom edge of the motherboard is a two pin temperature input. So you can put that 
uh, other thermistor, plug it into the motherboard right there, and have a second digital temperature readout. They've got our LED diagnostic code readout, another front panel USB 3.0 header. So this motherboard supports a total of five front panel USB, one USB Type-C, 10 gigabit, and then four USB 3.0, it's USB 3.1 Gen 1, five gigabit per second ports. And then we've got our front panel connector. Just above our primary um, PCI Express by 16 slot is another four pin fan header. That brings the total fan connectors on this motherboard to eight. Now the water pump headers are designed specifically to deliver up to three amps of power. To give you an idea, most of the time your standard 140 millimeter fan will use 0.15 amps. So in terms of like using splitter cables or whatever you wanna do, uh, yeah, those connectors, three amps, you'll be fine. Now just above your front panel connections is another recessed button. This is a CMOS clear button, so you can hit this button and clear the CMOS. Just next to that is another four pin connector. This is the Intel VROC connector. So let's talk for a second about this VROC module. What is this VROC module? This is a new thing on X299, but it's been in servers forever. This unlocks a software feature that lets you run M.2 devices in a RAID configuration through the PCIe slots. Now you can run M.2 devices on a PCIe card like the one this motherboard comes with, no problem, boot from it, do everything. But if you want them to be a part of a RAID array, then you need more software than the UEFI has. And this little key unlocks that feature that's already there, basically. So uh, now if you think about it, it's like, well, that sounds, you know, that sounds pretty cool, but don't I have all these M.2 slots? Why don't I use these M.2 slots? Well, check out this block diagram of X299. All those M.2 slots are going through the PCH. The PCH itself is connected to the CPU through DMI 3.0, which is only PCI Express 3.0 by four, or about 32 gigabits per second, or you know, four gigabytes per second through that interface. And so if you've got three of these super high performance Samsung drives, it's gonna be bottleneck city after just one drive. So the, you know, this module, you get that, and you can run one of your Samsung drives off the PCH, and you can run the other two off of a PCIe card. Uh, you know, you could run, you know, several of these PCIe add-in cards, especially if you get the 44 lane CPU. So this module unlocks that. If you try to run M.2 RAID with these really high performance M.2s without this module, it is just not even worth it because it's bottlenecking so bad. So that's what that module does. It unlocks that feature on the motherboard that's not enabled by default. You got to pay Intel extra for that. At the rear of the motherboard, we've got a combo PS2 mouse keyboard port two USB 3.0 DAC up ports. Now DAC up, what does that mean? Well, if you wanna run an external USB audio solution, these USB ports have an isolated power supply with reduced ripple, noise, whatever, which theoretically should improve the quality of power being delivered to your external DAC. Then we've got our USB 3.0 ports. Now one of these is a BIOS USB 3.0 port, meaning that you can plug this in and update the UEFI. That's gonna be critical, honestly, for the X299 platform for vendors to have that kind of BIOS support or that kind of hardware support for updating the BIOS without a CPU because you know the 12 core, 14, 16, 18 core CPUs are not out yet. So there will need to be UEFI changes to support those CPUs and this will let you put the UEFI on a USB flash drive, plug the flash drive in, and then as long as the motherboard has power, not even a CPU, you can update the UEFI. Updating the UEFI when you're building a system with one of these is gonna be an absolutely critical step. So don't miss it, don't forget it. It's been that way for the last two, three generations of boards. You just, you gotta have the latest software even when you build your machine. The software that you're gonna get on the motherboard, you really just need to update it from day one. Then we've got our USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type-C. We've got four USB 3.1 10 gigabit ports. And then we've got our Killer NIC on top and our Intel LAN on the bottom, and they're labeled. This is awesome. The Killer NIC and the Intel NIC are labeled on the back on the I.O. plate. That is just good job, nicely done. Then we've got our Combo 802.11ac plus Bluetooth module. This is where they, they hook up. And there's also that included RF Shield module that was in the box for, you know, if you want to clip that in and make sure that it won't come unlatched or whatever, you can totally do that. And then we've got our 7.1 audio solution with optical SPDIF out on the back. Now these are gold plated connectors. It's ESS Sabre um, high end audio DAC. So it's a, it's a solid implementation. The back of the motherboard also has the solid metal back plate with the, with the Aorus logo. I think the case that I'm going to put this in, you're not going to be able to see the Aorus logo, but it's got kind of a nice uh, finish to it. Now this back plate will give the motherboard extra rigidity when you're installing really heavy graphics card, when you're transporting your machine around, uh, you know, if you're installing other PCI Express devices that are really big and weighty, things like 40 gigabit ethernet, triple slot, you know, uh, graphics cards, whatever it is that you happen to be running. The audio capacitors on this motherboard are something new and unusual. It's the WIMA, W-I-M-A, high-end audio capacitors. Those are the red things you can see sort of 
near the shield. In terms of the PCI Express slot configuration, if you have a CPU that supports it, you will get two PCI Express by 16 slots, one PCI Express 3.0 by 8, and two PCI Express 3.0 by 4 slots. The wireless implementation is a killer AC1535. That's 802.11 AC, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, Bluetooth 4.1. And so, yeah, that will support up to 866 megabits of connectivity because it's a 2x2 two two configuration. All right, let's talk IOMMU groups and Linux testing. I'm really happy to report that like most of our other X299 motherboards that we've tested so far, the Linux support for this motherboard has been pretty great. The Intel NIC worked, of course. The audio was picked up and I could control it through Alsa Mixer. Uh, the beeper inside of GNOME would beep when I would pick stuff on the uh, <laughs> on the controls. Bluetooth was, was detected and supported as was the wireless adapter. Uh, so I'm really happy to see everything supported. For the IOMMU groups, Basically everything is in its own IOMMU group. This is really great news. So if you're gonna, you know, buy one of these and use it for virtualization, uh, and you're gonna have, you know, well, not with the KB Lake access, there's not really enough PCI Express lanes, but even the peripherals through the PCH through the chipset seem to do a good job isolating those. So nicely done, Intel. This would make a, a fine, you know, work and play machine uh, at a premium price, of course. But, uh, you know, a, a, a fine work and play machine with the IOMMU groups should be pretty good for virtualization. This is going to be part of our upcoming coverage of cubes and IOMMU testing on the Linux channel. Be sure you're subscribed to the Linux channel for that. Now for overclocking, you know, overclocking is a different story. And this is the Gaming 9. This should be the pinnacle of overclocking with its dual 8-pin inputs and that sort of thing. Basically, out of the box on my 7900X, I was able to hit 2200 almost in Cinebench without doing really any tweaking other than just basically being like, yeah, yeah, overclock, whatever, I don't care, through the uh, through the software that's, that's bundled. Uh, with a little bit more tweaking and a, and a little bit more uh, finagling, I was able to get the processor to go all the way up to 4.7, but it translated into a Cinebench score of 2493. That was the best Cinebench score that I got on this. And for CPU cooling, I was using the Fractal Celsius S24 dual 120 millimeter radiator for all of the CPU cooling. Now the CPU cooler starts to struggle to keep up a little bit, especially when we're talking about 4.7 gigahertz and above and past, you know, 1.15, 1.17 volts. But I did get a Cinebench score of 2493, 2473, something like that, just shy of 2500, which is really impressive for a 7900X 10 core CPU. So overall, that's been a quick look at the Oris Gaming 9. I love this motherboard. It is a really high-end motherboard. It is crazy expensive, but if you're looking for a crazy expensive X299 motherboard that's basically no compromises, this is it. If you pick up one of these and you want to share some stories or you want to show off your build, please do come to the Level 1 Text Forum. And now we've got a tour of the UEFI. So at the end of the video, there's not really a lot to talk about. I'm just going to show you the screens in the UEFI. That's only for like the ultra hardcore nerdy among you. But this should be pretty much all the screens in the UEFI so that you can see, you know, what you're after. I'm Wendell. I'm signing out and I'll see you later.